Welcome back to Booked Up. We have a special selection for the book club today, but I'm not exactly sure how to properly name the author. The book is the best-selling memoir, Spare, and the author is Prince Harry, Duke of Sussex. But doesn't he have another title? To be sure, I confirmed that those are still his, but he is no longer allowed to be referred to as His Royal Highness. But if I slip up and toss in an HRH here and there, my apologies. My three special guests with me today know loads more about the monarchy and these royals than I. In alphabetical order, they are Christopher Boozy, Linda Charnas, and Melissa Murray. You know Christopher from his big splash of a social media site called Spoutable. Before that, he started the site Bot Sentinel, which helped social media users spot and report troll bots. When he's not busy spouting, Christopher finds time to appear in the occasional Netflix documentary, including the recent one on Harry and Meghan. His effort to expose anti-Meghan hate accounts made him the target of plenty of internet ire himself. Linda's name should be familiar as she was my guest here on Booked Up in late January, discussing Hamlet, Talionic Law, AKA Retributive Eye for an Eye Justice, and America's Revenge Fantasies. The author of several brilliant books about Shakespeare, contemporary politics, and political psychology, Linda is a beloved professor of English, European Studies, and Gender Studies at Indiana University, Bloomington. And you probably feel like you know Melissa, given her frequent appearances on cable news, including as a guest host on several primetime shows on MSNBC. Not just a gifted communicator, Melissa is also the Frederick I. and Grace Stokes Professor of Law and the Faculty Director of the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network at NYU. Her award-winning research focuses on the legal regulation of intimate life. Let's dive in. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, thank you for having us. This is great. Yes, indeed. And I know um, I know that you all haven't met, so maybe I should just get you acquainted with each other. Um, I guess I'm just going to do the alphabetical order thing. Um, hey, Chris, we've uh, we've actually we've actually met before. Thank you, by the way, again for coming to speak on that panel, the Law Journal panel at, um, at Western New England a couple of years ago. Congratulations on Bot Sentinel, which launched in 2018. And then after that, recently, <laughs> on Spoutable. <laughs> um, you, Howard, I can't believe you had made time for us. So thank you for doing that. Um, I don't know, Christopher, if you've, you've um, met my friend Linda Charnas. Um, she is a professor of English literature, et cetera, at Indiana University. And I actually took a course in Shakespeare and political spectacle with her online. Um, a year and I'm ago, a former just, just a year right. ago. Mm-hmm. So even though you've had acquaintances recently um, with how the royals in real life are treated, um, uh, looking at the Meghan Markle hate accounts, Linda has, has uh, been following the all the royals who've been hated and and, and uh, murdered and such for oh. for centuries, um, and then and then Melissa, um, congratulations to you on on what are you going to become like a a, a, new, a a host now? Who have you sub for already? Oh, I don't, I'm not in any danger of becoming a host on MSNBC <laughs> at, at this point that I know of, um, but I have hopped in the host seat to sub in for friends like Mehdi Hassan and Ari Melbert and most recently Simone Sanders comes in. So <gasps> very excited awesome. to have that turn, but I have not given up my day job. Well, what's weird soon. that I, of course, I, I, you know, I should probably lead with the fact that you, you know, you are epic, like you clerked at the U.S. Supreme Court after law school. You're an NYU law professor. Um, you're an incredible scholar all around. So I'm sorry that I just go right for the, uh, the well, television to, to news. correct you, I never clerked at the Supreme Court. Oh. I clerked for Justice Sotomayor when she oh, was a judge. Right. So I'm just going to leave you with the idea that maybe <laughs> I might be the reason she's on the Supreme Court. <laughs> That's what I think. I mean, I'm, I'm love, joking. It's not. No, that. but I love being fact checked in real time because I saw that you clerked for Sotomayor. And so probably in my brain, 
I just assumed that you. I would have to be a lot younger for that. Um, but yes, she oh. was. She was amazing as a circuit court judge, and she's amazing as a Supreme Court justice. But I did not have the pleasure of working for her when she went to the the big show, as it were. Well, I want your skin routine because I assumed that you were that young and that you had cleared for her. Okay, enough, enough of this. We are here to talk about um, talk about the book Spare. And I want to, I'm going to, I guess, maybe um, start in reverse order um, and start at, with you now, Melissa Murray. Um, tell me anything you want to tell me about your reaction to this book, given that you are a serious uh, non-professional royal, royal watcher and also, were, you know, once uh, sort of were in, once lived in the Commonwealth uh, yourself. So um, I I will say that I come by my information and my knowledge, honestly. Um, I spent a lot of time as a kid reading up on the royal family for reasons that are just like really esoteric. I was like a total nerd kid and fell into a whole wormhole around Queen Victoria and how she essentially populated every royal house in Europe with her offspring. And as an only child, the idea of a big family that could literally take over a continent was really interesting and intriguing. And so I spent a lot of time and that led me to the current iteration of the British Royal Family. And so I was incredibly delighted with the publication of Spare. And in fact, so many people know that I'm interested in the British Royal Family that I actually received three separate copies of this book as gifts. What? So people were like, you know, this is the, like, you know, this is the gift that we got for you around the holidays and we've been holding <laughs> up really waiting to give it to you. Um, so I, I was extremely excited to read it and it didn't disappoint. I mean, it's a very well-written book. That's not surprising. Um, it has a terrific ghostwriter, J.R. Moringer, um, who is oh, also wait, the wait, author. Oh, wait, 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 wait. How did you know there was a ghostwriter? I was looking for that name. You just know that? Oh, I think I just knew that. Um, I, I think he's like, I think Prince Harry has also been very forthcoming and transparent about the use of a ghostwriter. Uh-huh. And um, Moringer is a terrific writer. He's the author of The Tender Bar, which is his own autobiography, which is, you know, a really wonderful coming of age story recently made into a movie uh, with ben a- by Ben Affleck, um, who stars as the uncle, but is also the director of that film. So I was really eager to read it and it didn't disappoint um, in a lot of ways. There's a lot of tea in there. I think not as much tea, I think, as some royal watchers would like, but certainly enough to start your own Boston Tea Party over here. (laughs) Um, Linda Tarnas, what are your first impressions? Um, My first impressions uh, were uh, how quickly I was actually caught up in the narrative and how well written it was. And I was wondering about a ghostwriter. So uh, that's, you know, that's Good to know. I was wondering in terms of the crafting of chapter endings and the leading towards chapter endings. I mean, it's a, it's a crafted narrative, um, not in, not in an artificial or negative way, but it's crafted and well, and well crafted. Uh, so, um, that surprised me. I was also surprised by how quickly I became engrossed in um, a number of themes. Now, of course, not terribly surprising since since uh, uh, I'm just going to call him Harry, okay? I'm, I'm just going to call him <laughs> Harry. Uh, not Spike or Has or any of the others. You can just call him yeah, Harry. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> we're, not good, we're not good enough buds yet for Has. Um, but uh, I, I was surprised how quickly he invoked the Hamlet scenario, as well mm. as the Gothic, the Gothic scenario, almost immediately uh, he was talking about, you know, having to meet his father in front of this, you know, as it turns out, faux Gothic structure. But the, the go- Gothic architecture seems to have been something that struck him. And, you know, later mm-hmm. on, I will have things to say about how I think that uh, you know, Bal- Balmoral and Gothic architecture in general impinges on and cramps, um, if not deforms, certain kinds of expressions of personality and personhood. So that's for later. I love that. And I and I don't mean to um, jump ahead of Christopher, but, but since you mentioned Hamlet, uh, I love the use of Shakespeare here, and I, I I feel like you can never teach Hamlet again. No one can until they read 
this passage I want to read out loud on on page 49. He talks about how his father, uh, Prince Charles, now King Charles, really adored uh, adored Shakespeare, especially Henry V, which I want you to say something about later, Linda, but I'm looking yep. at page 49. Yep. Um, and he, he says this, and it just, it just resonates. He says, um, I never doubted how much it upset Pa that I wasn't part of the Shakespeareless. That I was part. Uh, that I was part of the Shakespeareless <laughs> hordes. And I tried to change. I opened Hamlet. Hmm. Lonely prince, obsessed with dead parent, Watch his remaining parent fall in love with dead parent's usurper, dot, dot, dot. I slammed it shut. No, thank you. I mean, if that doesn't tell you what you need to know about his thoughts about Camilla, um, but also, in all seriousness, that's a pretty heavy play for a brooding prince uh, to read. It is, and and I'll say one more thing about that. I mean, Hamlet is tasked with, uh, you know, I mean... He's commanded by the ghost, remember me, right? Remember mm. how in a natural murder, blah, blah, but right. remember me. Harry is not tasked with anything by anybody. And that's part of the problem because he feels himself to be tasked with remembering his mother, not his father, his mother. Right. And so I, I felt like a lot of the... Um, a lot of the kind of emo dread that was building up uh, came from his fear that uh, that Diana would disappear into the ether with the movement of time, you know, with their adulthood, Mm -hmm. Camilla. Uh, So it's an odd kind, he's an odd kind of Hamlet. He's not an heir. Harry's not an heir. Uh, And he's going to insist that everybody remember his mother. Mm. Wow. And Christopher, you have somewhat of a, not direct, but maybe an indirect contact with the Sussexes. Do you want to tell us about both this book and the fact that I think I see you in these pages? There's a point where I'm like, that must be Christopher. Um, but, uh, but why don't you, um, why don't you, t- you tell us about your experience working either indirectly or directly for them? And I'm going to point out to where I found you in the book. Right. Well, just first off, I agree with everyone else on the panel that it is well written. And there's just one thing I want to, before we get into the other stuff, um, when he's talking about his mother and, and the memories of her and him thinking that she's not really dead, that it's all a, you know, a ruse because she was trying to get out, um, to hear that from him, I thought was interesting because I, I didn't know any of that before. I'm not a, a royal watcher and all that other stuff. So I thought that was also interesting. Um, but what really got me is actually early in the book when he's talking about the early years of being in school. And uh, I think he called them the matrons when they're bathing mm-hmm. <laughs> the students. I also, I knew nothing about any of this. And I also thought that was interesting. But anyway, um, I also didn't know. I was very touched. I found it heartbreaking that he had to hold his pain so far from him that he just told himself she had disappeared. Right. Um, and when he went through that tunnel uh, years later to try to experience what that was, I, I just couldn't imagine. But I knew nothing about the boarding school experience either, Christopher. Yeah, that was, that was yeah. Um, so you asked me about present day and the work. I mean, I have no quote-unquote direct, um, you know, contact with them. Um, You know, my company did the research into the hate campaigns of people that were and are still targeting them online. Um, You know, it it was just people that were supporting them um, came forward and asked if my company would look into it. We wasn't hired by them. We wasn't asked Mm -hmm. by them to do it. I mean, we did the research. um, And obviously... And tell me what you were... I, I think you sometimes call them like single hate accounts. Tell me what you were looking at and what you discovered. Yeah, I mean, the term single purpose hate accounts, you know, it's, it's accounts that are just primarily focused on one or a few individuals. Um, so in this case here, uh, on Twitter and also on YouTube, there were specific accounts that were targeting Harry and Meghan. Um, we had, you know, at the time, it was fewer than 100 accounts that was 
you know, responsible for a lot of the content. We were talking about millions of, of posts and reposts on Twitter and elsewhere um, and in terms of the reach. Um, yeah, so when we did this report, it was shocking for a lot of folks um, because they had no idea this was happening. And to be quite frank, we didn't either. Um, when we looked into it, we thought that you know, a lot of the people that were talking about this and saying, hey, look, this is happening, you know, we just thought that they were mistaken. But when we looked into it, they were actually you know, correct about it. But yeah, so we found these accounts and um, you know, they were created specifically to go after them. Um, you know, they were making money on YouTube and still are making money on YouTube, profiting from the hate. Um, yeah, By selling I mean, ads on YouTube. So, yeah, away. from the ads. Yeah, from the ads on YouTube, um, using PayPal and things like that. Um, that. So it's 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 one of those things where, if you're not online, again, which there are a lot of folks who are not, you know, on social media, um, you wouldn't know that this stuff was happening. You wouldn't know that there were YouTube channels dedicated to targeting Meghan Markle. Um, you would not know that there are Twitter accounts that were created specifically to go after Meghan Markle and, and Harry and the children. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's profitable. Were these, do you think these were independent actors or do you think any of them were from inside the palace or from um, you know, the kind of not necessarily Rupert Murdoch, but other kind of tabloids? Or do you think these are just independent folks just trying to be bottom feeders? All of the above. Oh. All of the above. Yeah. Um, some, some of the individuals are just, you know, m predominantly women who just found a way of making money, um, you know, creating these videos, uh, putting out this mis and disinformation and problems. You say pro women. Are they mostly white women who are just racist? Or I mean, you, I know, I see you just you just smiled at me, and I can you be a little more clear? Like what's going well, on? Here? Yeah, I was trying not to be controversial. I didn't know. Like uh, this I, is no, this is tr you know we do truth here. Okay. okay so yeah. So yes, they were predominantly Caucasian women, uh, middle-aged women uh, out of the United States, um, the UK. Um, you know, Australia. And yes, they, you know, they, I mean, the stuff that they were putting out about Megan was racist. I mean, there's just no way, there's, there's no other way to describe it when you are comparing her to a monkey and her children to a monkey, um, mm. you know. So yeah, um, but you asked about, you know, other folks as well. And yes, we do believe that, you know, People in the media um, were helping to, you know, fan the flames and were also taking information, which we did show that as well, was taking information from some of these accounts and, and actually going on air with this stuff, stuff that was completely false, that was made up. Um, you know, in terms of the palace, uh, you know, there, there was some evidence, but we never, we never put it out because, you know, once again, it's... It, we have to be able to prove a lot of this stuff. We just can't just put mm -hmm. anything out there. But there was some evidence um, suggesting that, you know, some of these individuals are not just random trolls, that it could be linked to the palace. You know, it's interesting to me before I um, change the topic, I think it's on page 372 where your company's research ends up being brought right into, uh, I think, Buckingham Palace, and I'm reading part of the book here. It says, um, because what often happens is, you know, um, Prince Charles or Camilla, or I should say now King Charles and the consort, which isn't the best name, um, that they would say, oh, don't listen to the press. You know, it's not a big deal. And he's pointing out, you know, how it's different, how it's um, racist and how the amount of it. And this is what he said. Um, I knew that they had rationalized it all, saying it was no different from what Camilla got or Kate, but it was different. One study looked closely at 400 vile tweets about Meg. Employing a team of data specialists and computer analysts, the study found that this avalanche of hate was wildly atypical, light years from anything directed to Camilla or Kate. And I'm not going to read some of that stuff, but it's it's overtly racist. Um, I will also, before I move on, is that, you know, as if that's as if it's okay to accept all the hate that's directed. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of freedom of speech, but there's nothing wrong with someone saying, putting out a, putting out a statement saying, you know, you know, we oppose this and this isn't true. I mean, if it's, if it's defamation um, and the laws used to be 
uh, a lot stronger in England, but they they could have acted. And as the book points out, they did. And, and, and as the book suggests, if what Harry's saying is true, there were times that Camilla, for example, to deflect attention on her son would, you know, you know, give some red meat to the press, whether it was true or not. And, and that it was, I also got the sense that um, Prince Charles and um, Willie, they both, um, because of the um, the pecking order um, uh, in terms of the, you know, closer you are to the throne meant that your comms people, and everyone has comms people, which is crazy, means that you, um, you get the best treatment in the press. And it, the way they treated um, Megan reminds me a lot of how they treated Diana, which is you're taking the spotlight away from Kate or, you know, in this case, you know, Charles was always jealous of Diana. I mean, I, I, I'm not that much of a royal watcher, but I always got the sense that he was envious of her um, and the hear that he was he's envious of Megan. And you sort of um, you sort of see this family dynamic, but it also reminds me more of a corporate dynamic where the the CEO does not want anyone to outshine him. Um, that any thoughts on that, um, you guys, about the 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 family dynamic and the and the manipulation of the press, not being a victim of the press? So I've observed this family for a long time, mostly through media coverage of them. So this is not, you know, up close in the palace in any event. But I do think there's a kernel of truth in that. Um, You know, I I think many people watching in the Diana years could see quite clearly that there was some irritation when Diana, the married in, eclipsed the heir to the throne and, and eclipse the queen herself, eclipse Princess Anne, who was doing all of this terrific work with Save the Children. Like nobody wanted to talk about them. They wanted to talk about Diana. She was this, you know, pretty young thing. And it was, you know, she sold tons of magazine covers. I think the better comparison though is really what happened when Fergie came along in 1986 uh. when she married Prince Andrew. I mean, she's really the more apt analog to Megan, ex- except not, right? So you know, Diana was glossy and glamorous and Fergie was sort of known as being down to earth and horsey. And, you know, she was loved, beloved for a a fair amount of time for sort of the breath of fresh air she brought to the royal family. And it turned swiftly on her. Um, You know, it took a couple of years, but it did turn. And then she was derided for being too brash. She was derided Mm -hmm. for being overweight. Um, And then, of course, she kind of proceeded to dig herself into a hole with her own peccadilloes involving her financial advisor, um, John Bryan. And there was perhaps another indiscretion with an American, Steve Wynn. So, you know, she kind of, you know, dug her own grave, so to speak, going on. But there's always, I think, this competition between the married and women. Um, you know, they love to see them joking around together. I remember famously there was a cover of People magazine with Diana and Fergie at Royal Ascot, and it was titled The Merry Wives of Windsor. I, I think oh, they gosh. were looking for that kind of thing with <laughs> Kate and Meghan, but it, it right. you know, it didn't surface in large part because Megan and Kate were very different from Diana mm-hmm. and Fergie. Diana and Fergie had kind of grown up in that sort of aristocratic or aristocratic adjacent world. Um, Kate did not, but she was very clearly English. But both Kate and Megan came to the royal family in their adulthood in a way that Fergie and Diana did not. I think Fergie was 26 when she married. Diana was only 20. Um, you know, They really hadn't worked in any real way. And they did, had, certainly hadn't had careers, so to speak. But this wasn't the case for Megan. I mean, it might have been more of the case for Kate, but it wasn't the case for Megan. And so, you know, the kind of palling around and the sort of putting women at each other's throats, I think just wasn't going to work in the same way, in large part because I think Megan was probably more accomplished than any other royal bride to date. And the comparison, like you couldn't tear her down for the same kinds of things because she was just more substantive. And so instead, when the worm turned, it turned in these really crass and coarse ways that focused on what actually made her different from the other royal married inns. And it wasn't her work experience or that she was American, although they love to talk about her being American, it was that she was black. And it really did have this racial tinge and it did feel different from what Diana got and the criticism that Fergie got and the criticism that Kate got and certainly the criticism that Camilla got which in large part was rooted in her own actions carrying on a decades-long affair with a married man. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, there's someone else in the list of people to compare um, Megan to might be Wallace Simpson, the the American that um, someone abdicated, didn't he abdicate the crown? Edward so VIII he, abdicated Edward, the throne for a while. So Wallace that he Simpson. could marry this, uh, this American. And I do, I have to say, in it, before I turn to Linda, divorced was, American. Divorced American, just like Megan was a divorced American. I think a lot about this book. Um, as a text, as a work of art, um, and also as, a, as we look at it as an object of art. And I think about the symbolism of um, a British prince getting his independence by marrying an American and coming to America. There's that, that sort of, that narrative of breaking free from the crown that runs through this too. But before I, I, I turn to Linda for a second, I don't know if you all noticed, I when I look at the couple things, when I look at the cover, you know, I think it's a brilliant cover of him staring right out at us. Uh, ginger hair, ginger beard. He makes a big deal about that part of his identity. He's, he's staring at you, blue eyes, spare, obviously meaning, um, you know, on the surface, it meaning means there's an heir and there's a spare. But spare also means that he's been spared in some way. Uh, and I also, then I looked at the back and on the back is this adorable black and white photo of Harry, like in what looks to be a scout's uniform, shiny shoes, and a beret. It's a military uniform. Right, but it's a ch- boy's version of a military uniform. And what's lovely, I don't know if you noticed, above the left pocket, breast pocket, it says HRH, the prince. And I cracked up when I stared at this because it dawned on me the one title that they took away from him was His Royal Highness. He can't use that title, but he put it on his book anyway. So I don't know if that was a dig, but I certainly saw it as one. Um, Linda, I want to return to you when you think about how this was written and the structure of it and how you began talking a bit about this in the context of, um, even if you compared it to a Shakespearean text, specifically when you were talking about what it means to try to keep, what it means to not be the heir, and also to be trying to keep your mother's memory alive. How does that fit within the context of the stories we know about the British monarchy? Um, a, a lot of things. I mean, and I'm trying right now to braid them together. I think part of how part of how I want to talk about this book um, is not particularly impressionistic. I mean, I think we all agree that it's a it's a much more um, engaging and emotionally engaging. Um, book than we expected it to be, I think. I mean, I when I started, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have, certainly wouldn't have read it had you not asked me to be on this. I would have been, but at the same time, while reading it, it triggered a lot of ideas for me that are not necessarily about Shakespeare. So I'm going to go beyond Shakespeare because mm-hmm. that's, because my wheelhouse goes beyond that. But one of the things... Really, Linda? I'm not sure if I'm going to let you out of that cage, but okay. <laughs> I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. I know you, you are. We're friends. <laughs> I, know, I know you're teasing me. Um, the, the overwhelming feeling that I get from the title Spare, just this is bivouacking off of what you just said, Jen, is that it is not... Um, it is something... It means to be held in reserve. It means uh, to be dry docked, to be dry docked, unless catastrophe, unless there's a flat tire, unless there's a blowout, unless there's a problem, uh, you know, understudy. Uh, it means all these things, uh, but what it doesn't mean is to be a person. And the strongest feeling uh, that I got while I was reading this and just being a teacher uh, of... 700 years of English monarchy, um, you know, just with everything that I teach, is that here you have a a rigid institution with its built-in hierarchies and structures. And and they went through, you know, the the crown went through traumas in, uh, you know, five years after Diana died, it was, you know, nobody wants Charles. Let's skip directly to Will. And I don't, <laughs> but, you know, the thing, and I'm, I know, I, but I've got a feeling that Charles would have been okay with that, except he didn't want to go down in history as, you know, the second, the second abdicator, right? He just right. didn't. Um, and now, you know, he's, he's in this role and I get the feeling that it, he's kind of like, yeah, too much, too late, uh, but he has to fulfill it. 
Um, I was struck by a number of really important Shakespearean themes. Um, I think about King Lear. I think about um, the youngest daughter who doesn't want to have to jump through the, you know, the paternal hoops. Cordelia. Get her, yeah. yeah, Cordelia to get her place. But on page 186 in this, uh, in Harry's book, um, there's this remarkable paragraph towards the bottom of the page um, when he's talking about how he felt when uh, when William got married and he was, you know, very happy and felt that Kate was, a, they, they were a perfect match and how he felt um, also when his father got married. Uh, I had the same feeling when Pa got married, the same presentiment and hadn't it come true. In the Camilla era, as I'd predicted, I saw him less and less. Weddings were joyous occasions, sure, but they were also low-key funerals because after saying their vows, people tended to disappear. So I want to put a, what do you call those little drop points on maps? I want to put a drop, <laughs> drop point there. Then, he says, it occurred to me that identity is a hierarchy. Wow. Yeah. Wow, indeed. That's, you know, we are primarily one thing, and then we're primarily another, and then another, and so on, until death in succession. Each new identity. Is this Jaquis and As You Like It, Linda? <laughs> it sounds no, like I'm not it. thinking about Jaquis. No, I know. But okay, sorry. I, I don't know Go if ahead, the sorry. ghost writer is injecting so much kind of Shakespearean a ghosting in here, or, you know, I just, I don't know who's, who's responsible for what, mm -hmm. but he is talking about the iterations of identity that build up over time. And um, to say that identity is a hierarchy, yeah, for every human it is, but within the structure of sovereignty and monarchy, Identity is not a process like Harry is describing it and feeling it and living it. Identity is a series of roles. So right. you know, William is the direct heir. Um, and when, you know, little Georgie is born, you know, Georgie. So at that point, Harry becomes a double spare. And it seems to me that this is a young man who probably struggled with feelings of how how can I become a person? How do I build an identity? How do I deal with my emotions and my feelings? And he writes a lot about drugs and drink and all the other stuff he did. Uh, but I think that in some ways, meeting and falling in love with Megan, who, as Melissa pointed out, is every inch a person and a grown-up by the time she meets Harry, she's got a uh, career right. and she's making her own money. Um, she uh, she's from the American middle class, uh, and she she is her own person. And I think that in many ways, without even trying to necessarily, I don't think she pushed him at all. But I think she encouraged him to express how he has felt over the years, and. When I use the word encourage, I don't mean push. I think she literally gave him the courage to be able to start talking about his feelings and to say, yeah, I want an identity, and it's not the one stuck in the closet in uh, uh, the royal hierarchy. I love that. And I'm, you just, you just, the, what you were, everything you said. Uh, transitions well to what I want to say and ask Christopher, which is fundamentally, this is a book about manhood and different kinds of masculinities. And the kind of man that I see Harry has grown into is someone I, I greatly admire. And I wonder as a man and thinking through your own development, um, what you think his experience was and what you think in um, the men that were role models and also what you think you know, it, does any does anything really speak to you that you admire um, here in the way he found his way, um, and 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 found surrogate a surrogate father or many surrogate fathers? Because you mentioned the surrogate mothers at the boarding school. Right. I mean, his story d definitely resonated with me. But I mean, we have. I mean, <laughs> he, he's a prince, and <laughs> yeah. I love how you said that. I mean, yeah. Our stories, and you know, and how I was brought up, and you know, and our experiences are vastly different. 
Um, but I could relate to, to some things in, in the book in terms of, once again, going back to, you know, his, his, his mother um, and me not having my father in my life when, you know, I was growing up and coming up with these stories in my head about him and all that stuff. I could relate to that. Um, him not wanting to face the fact that his mom was pro- you know, gone from this earth and he was coming up with all these different, you know, scenarios and, you know, that stuff. Um, Do you want to, I mean, what kind of stories did you tell yourself? Oh, I mean, okay. Um, I mean, so, you know, growing up and, um, you know, not having, you know, the dad in my life, you know, just wondering, you know, how... It was my laugh, like his laugh, you know, the things that I was into in terms of computers, which I didn't think he was into computers, but using my hands and things like that. Was he also into those type of things? And, you know, just, you know, coming up with scenarios in terms of if I was to ever meet him, what I would say, what we would discuss, you know, would he possibly be in my life in the future? You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, Reading the book, some of that stuff, you know, I, I could I could relate. Um, but there was a lot of stuff, I got to be honest, like hunting, for example, and him <laughs> talking about that experience. And I was just like, oh, my goodness. Like, I couldn't relate to that. I've never had my, you know, head pushed into a carcass. And, and you know, I just, you know. So, yeah, but, you know, I, I would have to say um, at the end of the day, some of the things I just, I couldn't relate to. I got to be honest. So the, you're speaking to the, vi- like the violent stuff in the military? Um, I or- mean, look, I believe like, for example, like the, the, you know, the drugs and drinking and stuff like that, believe it or not, like I've never smoked weed. I've never taken drugs in my entire life. Um, I believe you. I, yeah. As you see here wearing a, t- a, a suit, a tie and a white shirt, Christopher. It's not. <laughs> I, I, hey, but um yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's a lot of folks who... <laughs> I know, I know. What am I saying on Wall Street? Yes, I get you. I right. Get you. No. But, but when I tell that to people, you know, they're just like, come on, you know. And But it's the truth. So there, there are things that I just couldn't um, relate to. But, um, you know, him him having, and you, just, you said this earlier, um, you know, thinking about this, the quote-unquote surrogate mothers and then, yeah, him having, I guess, surrogate fathers and things like that, even though his father was... Uh, sort of kind of in his life um yeah i, I, I just so, certain things in the book i just couldn't relate to because like i said we just we had Listen, you di- were gonna di- di- yeah oh sorry sorry yeah i was just gonna say I... we just had vastly different upbringings that's it <laughs> right right experience well so you're gonna say something about manhood or something else well i i think one way to view it is as a book about manhood in, in much the same way the tender bar is a story about manhood, like a Bildungsroman, a, a coming of age story. I mean, there, there's that aspect of it. But I also think it's a story about manhood that is trying to be responsive to a media caricature of womanhood. I mean, a big part of this oh, story right. is yep. disputing the view that Megan made him do this, right? right? He's essentially setting up that he was already on this path. She was perhaps an intervening force, but she isn't the reason he's arrived at these conclusions. Um, And and I thought your comparison to her and the Duchess of Windsor was really apt because that is the analogy that the British press often likes to use. And, And it's not flattering, right? I mean, Wallace Simpson is reviled in British culture um, not because she is not solely because she is American and was divorced at the time she married Edward VIII, but because she was believed to have been schooled and practiced in sexual arts that entranced him and enthralled him and bewitched him and convinced him to abdicate the throne and to follow her wherever she led him. And, you know, I think it's this idea of this as a story about him becoming a man is about him becoming his own man to dispute mm-hmm. this narrative of her as the siren who has disrupted him from his path. I, I love that you said that. And Melissa, I noticed that what what I thought was quite interesting is how the, several women who he had been serious about previously, he paints such loving portraits of them. 
I think, to counterbalance the way the press treats everyone as sort of like a girl toy, right? As as a sort of like, look, who, you know, and, and, and degrades women and looks at them and their role in relation to him. And there was a woman before Megan for, who, who got him. Yeah, Cressida. Cressida. Right, who got him to talk about. Name, Cressida, yeah. I know, right? Trollis and Cressida. That was the one I didn't read, Linda. Um <laughs> Yeah, that's, but that's well, all interesting. All of those women yeah. are, they serve a purpose in his path, right? They're not castaways. They're not throwaway girl to- like girl toys. They're meaningful relationships. I think that's, you know, sort of the gentlemanly thing to do in a story when you're ultimately like, my wife broke the mold. Um, you know, she shattered the mold. But these women, when this was happening, these were really meaningful relationships that helped me to figure out where I was going that put me on the path where I could be in a place where I would meet my wife, where I would meet my Mm -hmm. soulmate. And so these weren't tawdry relationships. These were meaningful. And, you know, he honors them, even though it did not end the way they perhaps thought it might. You know, Christopher, it's funny. And for all of you, I, I know his life is so different than yours and any of ours. But what struck me in this was how little freedom he had to make his own choices despite this incredible wealth and how I'm still shocked that other than him, like no one goes to therapy. And I'm thinking this family has more money than God and they can't find each of them need therapists. I mean, the idea like that, that when his mother died, no one hugged him, that he'd never hugged his grandmother. I mean, what, what are these people? I mean, they're they're impoverished emotionally, right? And that's maybe the stereotype of the British, but also (laughs) the guy, the guy has to like, can't find his own place. I know he has to have bodyguards, but he has to like live in some sort of semi-basement apartment in one of his grandmother's buildings with very little light. And the guy who works there parks his car in front of his window and he doesn't get any fresh light. And you sort of think, I thought you guys were supposed to be, you know, I thought royals were just had a bank account of their own and got to go do stuff. And it didn't seem, and maybe, maybe that's the way he was portraying things. Um, but there's so many ways when he, you know, later in the book, he says, you know, kind of he, ta- he talks about this. But when when he's kind of pushed out of the family, he he's he's been infantilized. This is a thing that that Lind- I think Melissa and Linda, one of one of the two of you had said something about, you know, or maybe it was Linda that she was um, a full grown adult and he is still trying to figure out his own identity. Is he entitled to an identity? And when they kick him out and they take away his security and they do all this stuff. You end up with saying, you know, they're mocking him for not being able to survive and hoping he can't so that he has to crawl back to them, I think. I'm just struck by how little I'm struck by how what a trap being um, being a spare, being a spare part, like as you said, Linda is. But even the people who were not spares, who are serving their roles, they don't seem very free. They seem like they're trapped in a theater production they can, from which they can never break character. Oh, yeah. Trapped and, you know, I take it as being, you know, even going back to what you said earlier um, about when he's talking about the attacks and, you know, everyone goes through this or whatever. Um, I mean, it's cold. It's loveless. It's heartless. I mean, you know, and that's probably the reason why he saw what, even if when you look at the documentary, he saw what his wife was going through. He saw what Megan was going through with these people doing what they were doing online. So when you have, you know, the other part of the family who are just like, you know, we deal with this all the time, get over it, basically. And he's looking at it and he's seeing what his, you know, the pain that his wife is, is feeling, her being scared. She talks about being scared. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to live, to be quite frank, in a, in, a, in a family like that where, you know, no one really cries, no one hugs, no one shows emotion. He talks about that. You know, they were not allowed, you know, maybe, maybe once in a while there would be a, like a tap on the head or something along those lines. <laughs> but that's just, just weird. <laughs> I know, right? It's not how I, how I live. But yeah. Yeah, Linda? Um, I want to pick up on Melissa's use of the word buildings, Ramon, because... Uh, <laughs> That is very much the genre of this book, right? And the term, I mean, for any, for people who have, uh, you know, were undergraduates in literary studies, the genre is the coming of age story, right? The, the story about the education and the growth of a young man. And, you know, the, the 
Stendhal is the most fam- you know the most famous for the buildings Vermont, but then you have kind of arch, ironic writers like Henry Fielding, right, with Joseph Andrews and Tom Jones. But this is the genre, and the thing about this genre, and this is something that I texted you about this morning, Jim, as I was thinking about it. And Melissa, let's see what you think about this. This is a buildings roman. This is an autobiography with help, ghostwriting help, but it is presented as a Bildungsroman, not as a self-defense, but rather as a narrative of growth into who he is. And by having done that, it is generically a declaration of independence. Uh, He can do that. William cannot. And one of the things that made my blood run absolutely cold all the way through was every time uh, William called him Harold. Uh, You know, I mean, Harry refers to him as Willie, Wills, uh, but what we're seeing is a kind of bifurcation in this book. As Harry becomes more and more accepting of his emotional constitution and how it's changing his view, view of the world and his privilege and what he wants, and as it, he is allowing himself to realize how deprived he has felt of an adequate, right, a good enough holding environment, to use Winnicott's term, for me, it also conjures up the specter of Williams. The Buildings Ramon that that William will never be able to write because he's going to be king. And kings don't get to write autobiographies. And so one of the things that I see in this book is a real kind of um, battle of structures. William has to be channeled into the structures of rigid hierarchy. Harry, by doing what he's done, Um, has stepped out of that and out of those structures as his defining, um, you know, his defining architecture is going to be something different. And that is a huge act of bravery. I don't think it's just a, meant as a rebuttal of, you know, the, the abuse that was heaped on Megan. I really do think that we have an ontological clash here. He's married a modern woman who is a person and he's death. And as Diana was trying to become a person before, right before she died and maybe didn't quite get to make it. And so Harry is choosing the path that Diana was trying to craft for herself. And in the meantime, in this book, we see how, William is becoming more and more, in a sense, ossified or calcified as mm-hmm. you know, the, the man who will be king. And so there, there we see these divergent paths of coming into, I'm not going to call it manhood, I'm going to call it selfhood, Come, just coming into personhood. Who are you going to be? And Melissa, what do, you, do you have a, Linda directed that to you. So do you have a thought about that, given your years of royal watching? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting way to think about it as a sort of clash of different structures. But, you know, I would push back slightly to say being the monarch is itself your autobiography, right? I mean, you will have a legacy that, well, no, it can be. I mean, the Elizabethan age, the Victorian age, um, it, being a monarch is an opportunity to write yourself into history if you can do it well. I think the problem, and I think one of the tensions with William's inability to articulate a sense of selfhood in his own journey is because the role of monarch is perhaps not equipped to do that anymore, right? And Elizabeth I could be a modern ruler sending people out across the globe in service of her country. Victoria could literally colonize the entire world such that the sun never sat, never sat on Great Britain. Um, Elizabeth II uh, could have a legacy in which she managed to hold together the shards of empire, 
even as modernity knocked on the door. But that's not going to be the case for Charles and William. And, you know, that isn't about Harry's effort to articulate his own sense of self and to document it. That really is a broader, more existential question about whether monarchy matters in an increasingly modern world. Yes, yes. And let's ask, let's talk about, because that's where this has to go to, which is in some ways this is, you know, this is a, this is many stories all at once, I guess. It's everything everywhere all at once or something, but not that movie. And what, where I, I want to go to as we, as, you know, to kind of, as we start to wind down the conversation is what in the world is this constitutional monarchy and why does it still exist? There's one point in the book where Harry says he's not against it. And he says, oh, he, someone did the math or that maybe that he would say maths. Uh, and it turns out that it only costs, you know, if you're a British citizen, it only costs you like one pint, one pint a year to support the monarchy. And I'm like, yeah, is that one pint too many or not? And, you know, there's, I'm not sure exactly what they're doing there. Um, I understand, but I, I'm curious if you have thoughts on that and to sort of, to actually stir the pot a little more. I'm going to read you something quite controversial written by a guy Patrick Franny, I think he, this was in the Irish Times, so so brace yourself. He said, um, having a monarchy next door is a little like having a neighbor who's really into clowns and has daubed their house with clown murals, displays clown dolls in each window, and has an insatiable desire to hear about and discuss clown-related news stories. More specifically for the Irish, it's like having a neighbor who's really into clowns and also, your grandfather was murdered by a clown. Discuss. Um, well, I, I, wanna, I would like to say something in response to M- Melissa's oh. point first, before okay. we discuss clowns, uh, which <laughs> scare me that we move into horror territory there. Uh, but I think that a legacy and crafting a legacy is something entirely different than um, building a personal identity. And I know um, that, you know, the, in uh, Elizabeth's, uh, Elizabeth required an awful lot of technology and enablers and portrait painters and poets and, you know, a whole apparatus uh, to create a very artificial picture of who and what she was. So I think that um, I, I think that you have far less autonomy and power to actually define and create yourself as a monarch than you do as uh, as. A, as Harry has just proven, as a spare. I mean, he's now made a spare, a kind of, you know, identity uh, category that can be worked with. Um, So I love this. This is so interesting, this idea, the difference between what legacy and identity, right? Right. I think it's a really... But this is the point that I'm making. William does perhaps doesn't get to have an identity because he is literally yes. the anthropomorphic representation of the that's state. That's what I was saying. And yes, that's yes. 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 I mean, exactly. like this is sort of Hobbes and Leviathan, right? He is the state and that comes with enormous riches and privilege and whatnot. And, and he seems to be pretty accepting of quite a lot of it, certainly the helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it does mean that you operate within a, relatively narrow confine that other people don't have. And and interestingly, Harry is unlike any other spare in history because he's outside of the fold and his wife is outside of the fold in real ways. This isn't an Andrew and Fergie situation where you're just basically spotting the monarch constantly. Uh Mm -hmm. I mean, but, and that's different. And, you know, I, I mean, I do think William has an opportunity to forge his own self of his own sense of identity, but his identity has always been circumscribed and always will be circumscribed by role. And the role that he has to move into, perforce, yeah. Oh, he doesn't have to. He can abdicate and and he could leave, but he won't. (laughs) He could also dismantle, right? He could take the role and dismantle or he, you know, but it doesn't look like he has that personality. It's not his temperament. Can we go back to the clowns, though, and talk about and that's a metaphor for me for the history, you know, that it's not it's not all, you know, fancy parties and castles. There's a lot of war and blood and slavery and exploitation. And, you know, there was a lot, you know, when Queen Elizabeth died, there were there was just just like between Irish Twitter and black Twitter. It was really pretty interesting. And I'm speaking generally in those terms of, you know, what that legacy was and. 
I'm going to ask you, Melissa, to tell me what you, because I don't think you detest the monarchy. I think you're fascinated, but, but do you think it should, can, you know, what do you think the role it serves and what are your thoughts about the, the big debates and maybe the um, grave dancing that went on when Elizabeth died? So, I mean, I, I actually was living for the marriage of Black and Irish Twitter. I think it's Black Irish Twitter <laughs> now, and it was kind of amazing. Um, but, but I will say this, I, you know, I think we got a very clear sense of kind of the xenophobia and sort of low level racism that may undergird British society, you, you, in, unconsciously perhaps, um, because there were all of these people, brown people, yellow people around the world who were looking at this moment and like, okay, that's our head of state. And we've got particular feelings about this moment. Right. Um, we respect her, we revere her perhaps, um, we admire her sense of duty, but we've got we've got complicated feelings about this entire enterprise. And it wasn't great dancing. I mean, some yeah, of okay. it was, but I think the right. majority of it was a sort of very nuanced, like yeah. what does it mean to be colonized? Even mm-hmm. as you may have admiration for the person who is literally the symbol of colonization in your country, like what does it mean to live with the residue of that, the material and governmental residue of colonization? And instead of sort of thinking, sitting with it and being like, okay, people can be complicated. People can be nuanced. The queen can be complicated and nuanced even in her passing. All you got from some of these folks on the other side of the pond was like, you're disrespecting the queen. Stop it. Stop it. She's not your queen. She's not your queen. That was all I heard. Like, she's not your queen. (laughs) She's not this. And who do you think you are? Are you American? I'm like, well, I think I'm someone whose family grew up literally under the thumb of colonialism. Like, I have gone to get vaccinations at Princess Margaret Hospital. Like, when do I get to say something about the queen, if not now? I mean, so this idea of like, what is theirs and what belongs to the Commonwealth, I think was so starkly presented and presented in this way that I think made clear to so many what Meghan Markle was up against during Mm -hmm. her very limited time in that family and in that country. And I think the reverse is also true in that, like I was, I was in England um, doing research um, and also at a conference in in, in Oxford. And I was happened to be there during the, um, the platinum Jubilee and I like that kind of, I do like the pageantry and the tchotchkes and I love Paddington Bear. And I have some friends on the left who are like, you know, don't be a royalist and monarchy is terrible. I'm like, yeah, but I kind of, there's some pieces of this that I enjoy. So how do we reckon, you know, I think it's interesting to, to, to wrestle with that, but where does that leave us? Where does that leave us now? I mean, how does this institution um, make peace with its past? And what, and more importantly with this book, I was stunned at the amount of racism, reminded of the amount of racism directed at Megan and that somehow that they, that the people, that the people in the, uh, what, what did they, what did the Sussexes call it? They call it the, not the corporation, the firm, firm. the people in the firm at the palace that they didn't, that they, they consciously decide just to ignore even within their own family, the overt racism, not to address it and to then just do these ridiculous tours around the Commonwealth countries uh, I just don't, any, any thoughts on how, what should happen next? And we have no right as Americans to really say, uh, how they govern themselves over there. But, you know, what does this book tell you, uh, about, about where that's headed? This, I, you know, I can't prognosticate about the monarchy. I do think it's a, fi- it's, at this point, it's a finite institution. It may very well be that, that William will be the last British monarch. I don't know. Um, One thing that struck me as quite tragic about this story as a family story, because it's also Mm -hmm. that. So, you know, we can talk about it in terms of monarchy and sovereignty, um, but it's also about family dynamics. And everything would have been different if Charles and or William had 
taken Harry's feelings seriously. If they had simply been willing to talk with him and listen to what he had to say without dismissing it out of hand. And I think if there's anything universal about this story, because there's very little aside from that that is universal, right? This is a completely alien world to all of us in terms of the wealth and all the other things. But this family dynamic of being treated as if you are not worthy of being heard and as if your emotions don't matter and your feelings don't count. And it would have been so easy, I think. You know, Harry was very upset when stories were printed about Meghan and the royal family just blew them off and Harry said, why don't you say something in defense of her? Just put out a few lines to the press. Well, but but I don't think William wanted him to marry her. I mean, you see yeah, the but, number but, of encounters. Abso- absolutely. And that's I think that's that's very, very clear. But what what Charles and William and to some extent Elizabeth, she was sort of hands off. What they did was they decided that um, that family was vastly less important to them uh, than a way of doing things within, um, you know, within their sovereign structures. And I don't, I don't blame Harry at all. Uh, They did not treat him as a person. Um, They treated Meghan as even less of a person. And I think she tried. I think she genuinely tried to not fit in, but to just, you know, she tried. Uh, yeah. So I want to, as we wrap things up, I want to ask each of you, um, starting with you, Melissa, is there anything that I didn't talk about that you want to say about this book? I think we've covered a lot. Um, I will say, I think this book pulled a lot of punches. Like I don't, I mean, I think some tea was spilled, but I don't think all the tea was spilled. Mm -hmm. And just the part where Harry insists that there is value to ordinary Britons in the monarchy, I think, shows his allegiance to this institution, even as it has tried to hobble him in meaningful Mm -hmm. ways. And, you know, there is, you know, that too, I think, could be understood as a kind of family story. I mean, he's loyal to the family and to the firm they represent. And that comes out in very clear ways. And, you know, I think, he soft soaps his father. I mean, I think there's very much love for his father and a, a trying to understand why his father was the way he was. I think there is some soft soaping of his brother and his brother's behavior over time. Um, and I think he's trying to leave the door open for some kind of reconciliation and, you know, may perhaps in the words of James Cameron and Titanic, an absolution that may never come. Mm. Christopher. What didn't I talk about? What didn't you talk about? Uh, no, I, I, as Melissa stated, I think we covered a lot. Um, and I, I agree with a lot of what uh, Melissa said. Um, the only thing I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure he's, he's leaving the door open. Um, I, do think, I do think part of him, because this is the life that he lived for so long, misses it. But I also think he enjoys his freedom now. I think he enjoys actually having a life and not being the quote unquote spare. Um, and something else you guys were talking about before in terms of the dynamics and, 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 and Megan trying, um, you know, where Harry was the spare, I think she was cannon fodder. I think for them, you know, it was, mm-hmm. let's throw her to the wolves, let her be. Uh, the person that's constantly being attacked and oppressed, and it kind of gives them, you know, the ability to do whatever they need to be able to do and not be in the press and, and, and be in the tabloids, whatever. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's why I believe that they didn't put out statements and things like that because they were the ones that were, that were leaking a lot of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, treacherous. Yeah. Linda. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's Linda, it. Linda, yeah. I like that. Uh, Linda, you're. Uh, your final thoughts. I agree completely with what Melissa said. Um, he pulls a lot of punches, Harry does, and I do think he desperately emotionally wants to keep the door open for the future. Uh, and that's a really tough needle to thread, to tell your own truth and try at the same time to keep that door open. But I think that's what he's trying to do. Well, I want to 
thank you all. Um, and uh, thank you for coming here today to talk with me about this book and giving me a reason to read it because it has changed my my perspective on him. Um, I just thought he was a uh, kind, of, kind of a party boy whiner. And now I actually see him as a strong, a strong person who's gone through quite a bit, um, made his way in the world, and most importantly, stood by the woman that he loved, who loves him and has made his own way. Um, and I tend to side more with Christopher. I think he, I mean, I think he might like a reconciliation, but I think he's mostly closed the door, but had to kind of say a few nice things so he didn't alienate his readership. But maybe there's some truth <laughs> somewhere in between all of this and time will tell. So thank you all. Thanks for thank having you. us. Thank you. I could have talked so much more with my friends about Spare. Uh, what I want to let you know for those who have not yet read the book is it's beautifully written. Um, easy, easy to, I think, read in a couple of sittings, um, even though it's 400 pages because it's a memoir. Um, and uh, as was noted, there was a very uh, gifted ghostwriter working with him you will really enjoy you know how it how the story is told i i want to i want to read for you um something that i thought was kind of a helpful passage in the book that might answer one of the questions that i think a lot of people may have that question is if Harry and Meghan want to get away from the paparazzi and be out of the public eye. Why then did they sit down with a televised interview with Oprah Winfrey? And there are a lot of folks who say that, you know, that's hypocritical or it's a contradiction. But I feel like I understand why they did that. It was their way of getting their story told from their perspective instead of these pieces of gossip and and sort of untrue statements and shades of the truth that were coming out in, in the tabloids in Britain. But also, um, they were criticized uh, by their own family members for, for for doing this. And let me just let me just uh, th- th- set up this interaction before I read it. Um, there was this is sort of the last time it sounds like that they um, may have seen each other. Uh, I guess they saw each other in person um, at their uh, at Queen Elizabeth's funeral. But this book ends with uh, when Queen Elizabeth's husband Philip had passed on and. This is when the family is quite estranged and Harry is, sees um, Prince Charles and, and, and his father uh, asks him um, why in the world he had this, this chat with Oprah. He, here's, what he, uh, he, here's what he says. He said that he felt he had no choice. And it said, um, the family said, you know, and his friends, even people he was close to said, how could you reveal such things that he did in the interview about your family? I told them that I failed to see how speaking to Oprah was any different from what my family and their staffs had done for decades, briefing the press on the sly, planting stories. And what about the endless books on which they'd cooperated, starting with Paz 1994, Crypto Autobiography with Jonathan Dimbleby, or Camilla's collaborations with the editor Gordy Gregg? The only difference was that Meg and I were upfront about it. We chose an interviewer who was above reproach, and we didn't once hide behind phrases like palace sources. We let people see the words coming out of our mouths. So to me, um, that seems like a, a good justification or rationalization, not just for the Oprah interview, but also for this book, because it's not as if they, uh, his family members with, with whom he is feuding are silently uh, suffering the indignities of his, his version of things. They are, as he notes, planting their own stories and getting uh, their spin out there as well. If you have any thoughts about the book and want to share them with me, please uh, let me know what you think. Send me an email to bookedup at politicon.com. And you can also write all of us at Booked Up at P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. I will be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, please follow Booked Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. 
And while you're there, please give us a five-star review. It really will help other people find the podcast. Thank you for listening. 